Hello uh, and welcome to the Japan Zoominar at UC San Diego. I'm Ulrike Scheda and I'm the host of this seminar. Allow me a few words uh, explaining who we are. If I can find my button, there it is. Uh, you are here at uh, the School of Global Policy and Strategy at UC San Diego. Our school is a school of, uh, uh, an international relations and public policy school that focuses on the Pacific. We offer seven degree programs, including a Master of International Affairs with a Japan specialization. If you're interested in our program offerings, please go to gps.ucsd.edu. At GPS, we have a Japan Center. It's called JFIT, the Japan Forum for Innovation and Technology. We do research, we educate, we inform, and we provide opportunity uh, for uh, San Diegans to access Japan and Japan to come to Southern California. If you are more interested in more, um, to hear more about our acti activities at JFIT, please go to jfit.ucsd.edu. I also have a website that you can uh, you know, look at all of this in a slightly different formatting. Uh, our Japan Zoominar is a weekly event. Uh, it's at the same time every week. It's 4.30 in California and 8.30 a.m. On, uh, on Wednesdays in, uh, in Tokyo. Uh, today, of course, we have Brad Glossman here, and I will introduce him shortly. If I lose you before the end of the session, uh, please note that we will have a, another discussion of energy, this time looking into the future with Masakazu Toyoda, the chairman and CEO of the Institute of Energy Economics in Tokyo, and Kenji Tateiba from TEPCO Grit Incorporated. And following that, we'll uh, talk a little bit more about culture and Ruth Benedict, as well as robotics and the digital transformation of Japan. All right, so then I'll have Brad Glasserman here. Uh, I'll introduce him shortly. Now, why did I invite Brad? It is because, as our good colleague, uh, Steph Heigert pointed out, you know, Brad has just finished a, published a book about six months ago called Peak Japan. The, great, the end of great ambitions, where he basically argues that it's all about, it's, it's gonna go downhill from here, which kind of looks a little bit similar to my book, which was published in June. So I'm, as always, Brad, uh, about a year behind you. Um, and uh, they look fairly similar, uh, but on Brad's cover, you see all the cracks, and on my, you see the hopefully appealing uh, sticky. So um, we're here today, let me stop my share, to discuss how both of us, you know, we've been discussing Japan for 30 years, how we could have ended up uh, writing such very differently sounding books. I, I, I suspect at the end we might actually end up in the same place, but uh, let's see where that goes. So Brad Glosserman is the Deputy Director and Visiting Professor at Tama University, the Center for Rule Making Strategies in Tokyo. He's also a senior advisor to the Pacific Forum International, which is in Honolulu, and uh, he was there for 16 years as director of research and executive director. Before that, he spent, um, from 1991 to 2001, he spent time at the Japan Times as a member of the editorial board, and is today still a contributing uh, writer and editor for the Japan Times. He's the author of the Japan-South Korea Identity Clash, uh, East Asian Security and the United States, which he wrote with Scott Snyder in 2015, and of course, the aforementioned Pete Japan, uh, the end of Japan as we knew it. Uh, he, uh, Brad has a BA from Reed College and a son named Reed. He has an MA from John Hopkins, our biggest competitor to GPS, but we'll forgive you because uh, GPS didn't exist when you attended John Hopkins, I guess. You also have a law degree from George Washington. University, and um, I could have summed all of this up very briefly by saying that you're one of the uh, most interesting and um, intellectually curious observers of Japan today. So thank you, Brad, for making time and joining us. Great. What you left out is you and I are old friends and sparring partners, and I'm usually bruised and battered by the end of our discussions. Uh, Dr. Shada, Rika, and I have had many an afternoon and evening at a beer garden on Tokyo rooftops. Um, it's, you know, I was, I was under the impression, I'm a little, sort of, this is an academic WWE cage match, right? And I thought we were going to pick on your book, not mine, but, uh, I think it will, as you said, it, it'll, uh, it will dovetail together quite nicely. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. It's always good to see you. Uh, all of you who I can't see, thank you for taking the time for your mornings or evenings and, and joining us. 
let me offer you a, a, some kind of quick thoughts about Peak Japan, its genesis, the argument very briefly, uh, so that we've got more time to have a conversation about the things that are of interest to you. Um, the genesis of the book was frankly in the aftermath of the March 11th, 2011, you know, uh, earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear disaster. A funder came to me and said, is this a Meiji moment for Japan? Is this going to be the, the, the shock that, that, that jolts it out of its torpor out of the two lost decades? And um, they said, here, here's some money, go answer that question. So I, I rooted around in Japan for a, a while and quickly came back with uh, the answer, which was no. Uh, but I felt as though a postcard was probably not what my funder wanted. So I actually had to dig in and answer, well, if this wasn't going to be a Meiji moment, then why not? You know, and in retrospect, it may feel as though that's kind of a silly question, knowing what, what we all do about Japan and how it's evolved, but at the time, it really was, I think, a, a moment of introspection and a moment of great possibility. I discuss this in the book. Dick Samuels has written uh, academic articles that merely focused on the use of the words change and, 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 and uh, that went into some depth. And, you know, a five, a shock of 5% of GDP, uh, th this notion that somehow or other the country had failed in a very, very fundamental and catastrophic way had prompted great deal of introspection. And I remember being in international conferences in weeks afterwards where the Japanese were saying, yes, this is our moment. This is, and, and you Americans, by the way, don't worry that we're going to become so totally introverted in dealing with this, that we're going to turn our back on the rest of the world. But nonetheless, you know, I think as we've all fairly quickly come to understand, and as the book lays out, in fact, it was a blip. It wasn't certainly no, no great course correction. And so I'm trying to understand why and what that means. And what I realized over time essentially was that, you know, to answer that question, you really had to look at Japan in its totality. And, um, you know, so what I did was, as, as Ulrika said, I, I moved to Tokyo in 91. So I had a decade of, of living in Japan as a journalist, as a journalist, as an editorial writer, which I'm maybe kind of removed from the real rules of journalism. Um, maintain a, a relationship with Japan, had been going back four or five, six times a year when I was in Hawaii, um, and was decided that, and, and I offer this to you as, as well as an important kind of point of reference, particularly for those of you that are studying Japan, that I wanted, as I looked at this question, to get away from the usual suspects. And that meant, I think, two particular important ways to approach the problem. The first was, don't just talk to the politicians and the think tankers and all the folks that were generally invariably having the same conversations with all the time, whether it's in Washington or in Tokyo. And so it was for me, I wanted to talk to bureaucrats and I went out and I talked to artists and I talked to students and I talked to business leaders and NGO leaders. And I was just as opportunistic as I, as I could in having every possible conversation. Some of the most interesting ones for me, by the way, were a series of roundtables. I had about five or six in universities with university students all over the country, Tokyo, Kyoto, Okinawa, uh, Osaka. And the opportunity to you know, speak to the future and, and have these conversations and not people who were, were speaking the language that I typically or we typically engage with was, was incredibly useful. Second, as I just kind of quickly mentioned, I got the hell out of Tokyo. You know, most of us that go to Tokyo, that go to Japan, spend our time in Tokyo. And the fact of the matter is, Tokyo reflexively, as I like to say, looks right across the Pacific Ocean, way back to the U.S., and that's where everybody, that, that's their orientation, and that shapes almost everything they do. Get out of Tokyo. Get out of Tokyo because, first of all, it's a rich and diverse country, and there's some really cool places to go. I became especially fond of Fukuoka, became one of my favorite cities. And what's neat about Fukuoka, for example, is that within 10 minutes of any conversation with somebody who lives and works in Fukuoka, that's not just about, you know, Hakata ramen, is going to be a, they're going to inform you very quickly that they are closer to Seoul, Busan, Shanghai, Taipei than they are to Tokyo. And this orientation away from, that, that where they're looking to Asia rather than looking necessarily to the, the United States is a very important distinction. And it's one that I think is an important corrective to the prevailing view among people that do what we do. And what happens, you know, a natural kind of uh, obvious consequence of getting out of Tokyo and talking to this different group of people. The other thing that I think was really important in this book was I tried only to speak to Japanese. Now, the sourcing, of course, when you look at the articles, there's a lot of gaijin in there. But I wanted the Japanese to speak for themselves. 
So I only interview and I only let, you know, Japanese voices inform my thinking about Japan. And I want this to be their stories, which I think speaks to some degree to the audience, but I, it was also my thinking attempt for me to finesse certain questions of expertise, of outlook, of, uh, and get away from this, the inherent notion of let, let, let a gaijin tell you what this, what, what's wrong with this country and what needs to be done to it or for it or whatever the appropriate preposition is. None, and so this, this, this Japanese voice piece was, was, I think, interesting and important. And I think it's very revealing. And, and I was fortunate enough to speak to some very smart people, some people who at the time I thought were interesting and have since then become not only interesting, but important and whose views have mattered. And so scattered throughout Peak Japan uh, are all sorts of, I, I will, will surprise you, um, you know, uh, and, and we can discuss that if you want. So the structure of the book really quickly, let me run through it, was is that there were, you know, seven chapters, the setup, whatever. And I use the mechanism, the, 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 the literary conceit of shocks to explain what goes on. So in 2007, eight, you've got the layman shoku, which is my excuse for using using the economic prism to look through, look through Japan through that particular prism. 2000, and, and I want to thank the Japanese for so his, so neatly arranging their history to make this possible for me. So 2000, sorry, 2008 is Lehman. 2009 is the Seiji Shoku. I like alliteration, which is the DPJ coming to power, which becomes the 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 window to look at political developments. 2010 is the Senkaku Shoku which is the foreign policy question as the, when you have the first Senkaku crisis under the DPJ government. And then in 2011 is of course the, um, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the earthquake and soon, or tsunami earthquake and nuclear disaster, which becomes a question of really examining national identity. Um, then 2012, Mr. Abe comes back to power at the end of the year. So we use that as if you will, an opportunity to look at the Abe inter interregnum as I call it through each of those four windows. And then the assessment of where that leaves the country in the conclusion. And that's, so it's, it's a pretty straightforward assessment. Um, I think, you know, at, at the end of the day, peak Japan is a statement, and I want to be very clear, you know, it, it's a peak. It's not, it, it doesn't necessarily it suggest there's a clash or crash. It doesn't suggest that we're necessarily going to go sharply down. And I've talked to people that are invariably smarter than myself about when, how long, the economic situation, et cetera, is sustainable. No one can give me an answer. So whether this is a plateau, whether it's a sharp, uh, uh, you know, going to be a, a quick decline, nobody's quite certain. And, and I'm certainly not going to be, uh, I don't offer that. But, you know, what, what you've got a, a, a broad array of factors that militate against change. And I mean, I think one of the, the great insights I had, which perhaps shows you how shallow my thinking is, is this idea that so, you know sometimes not making a decision is a decision, and I think that you know one of the great insights or, or, or facts of Japan is is that there is nothing, and, and one other reason why I think is no no point in someone like me offering up suggestions, unless of course somebody wants to pay me to do that, which I am, I can be bought. Um, is the Japanese have been well aware of all of the problems that their country has faced. It's not as if they need some you know, outsider to tell them what's going on and what the issues are. You know, the demographic crisis has been evidence or it was, was anticipated since the 1970s. And yet continually, whether it was that question or whether it was the cleaning out of the, the, the financial situation at the, at the, uh, during the, the, the decade of the 90s, the first of the lost decades, the political chain, uh, uh, stagnation and paralysis, all of this, you know, the Japanese were well aware of and they chose not to make a change. They felt as though ultimately that, um, you know, the system was livable and was comfortable and was serving its purposes. And so, you know, one of, in, invariably, when I've had these, these uh, book presentations, the first question came from someone who began as these invariably uh, always do with, well, I haven't read your book yet. And so that's always a great place to begin criticism. Uh, and then the next one was, well, what's your problem with this country? You know, everything is great. If you look outside, I, I want to live here. I like it here. Everything is wonderful. The trains are on time and they still are. Um, why is it that the Japanese have to change? To which my answer is, well, in fact, they don't. And I'm not suggesting that they have to change. What I'm suggesting, and, and this comfort, this complacency is really perhaps the largest attitudinal barrier. For me, to, to skip to the end of all of this is, the concern that I have is, is that the Japanese leadership, particularly Prime Minister Abe today, presents a picture of a country that is outwardly engaged, is energetic, is capable of doing great things, which 
it is, except that cadre of leadership, I don't believe represents the mass of Japanese people. And the problem is, is that they create by nature of their, their, their engagement, their energy, their particular outlook, a sense of expectations or a set of expectations about what Japan can and will do. And by, to my accounting, all of the attitudes, all the structures, all the material resources that the country can bring to bear on problems is not up to that level. And in the absence of change, the gap between the rhetorical, the, the, the expectation and the reality is going to widen. And that's when the real crisis occurs in terms of relations, say, between the United States and Japan or Japan and any other country. And so what I was, what my, my, my chief argument is, is that I'm trying to explain to non-Japanese why it is they need to be very skeptical about looking at the leadership of the country today and anticipating that that somehow is going to continue into the future or that Japan is going to be the partner that they, I think, expect it to be. Now, it can be. It can better reconcile the realities of power with their particular material circumstances, but it's going to require some real change. And at the end of the day, I don't sense that the Japanese are prepared to do it. They like their lives too much, as is. And there is nothing that, it, that, that the rest of the world can offer, understandably, that says, we're going to offer you a better life for all the changes you're going to make. And so the combination of that uncertainty, the risk aversiveness, and then finally, a, frankly, a, a, a discontent or disenchantment among young Japanese where their feeling is, we saw our parents and grandparents make extraordinary sacrifices in the name of a you know, national project of renewal and growth and greatness, and it didn't make them happy. And so we're not prepared to do that. And that was one of the great takeaways from so many of the conversations with young people that I have. And so you, you combine all of those levels and others, other issues, you know, the structural questions of debt, of deficit, of demography, um, and there's some others. Uh, you put all that together and you end up with a very, very, uh, a, a country that strikes me, and, and I think it sadly, is, it, well, not sadly, an analysis that's being borne out is a country that has in many ways reached the peak of its potential and is not prepared to make the changes that it must do, must make if it is to maintain that leading position in the world. That may not be a bad thing. It's something that I think the Japanese are, are happy to take on. Um, there's a lot more to it than that, but I think just in the interest of time and uh, a better conversation, I'll stop there and, and let you drag it out and anybody disagree with me and, and please don't make me cry. Okay, <laughs> I promise to be kind. So oh, yeah. that's, yeah, uh, uh, group. this book is a great tour de force to through what Japan is, is doing. And in fact, I will assign the first chapter, which is sort of your background. It's titled The Unhappy Country. And it's your background of how Japan got basically from Meiji, and you do that very well, and sort of in a, a very fast sort of version to post-war Japan and the bubble period and, and, and how Japan actually got to these sort of the series of shocks. Right? And uh, it's, a, it's a great background chapter. And, and all of these chapters are exceedingly well researched and and, and carefully done. There are data there. So it's actually a lot of fun to, uh, to you know, for some sort of intellectual discourse. So here, here's, my, here's my thing where I really would like to hear what you have to say in reaction. So you go through these shocks. And, and of course, I only come in from the business side. So the, the first, first and the answer to the first question is, so how can we both write these different books is that I was looking very closely at, is there still hope for Japanese business? And the answer is absolutely yes, for, for the reasons that I lay out in my book. But I, I want to make a sort of a larger sort of pushback argument. And that is, you have these shocks, you have, I mean, it's, it's in a way, one, one has to feel sorry for Japan, right? Every time they kind of recovered, so here's the banking crisis, 1998, and big trouble. Koizumi comes in as prime minister, kind of gets everything back on a sort of a positive track. No sooner is Japan kind of over the banking crisis, uh, the Lehman shock, which is Japan's word for the global financial crisis happens in 2007, 2008. No sooner has Japan discover, recovered from the Lehman shock that Tohoku wipes out, you know, uh, uh, you know some of the, the pillars of, of some of the economic, um, and, and of course, psychological impact of that was huge. No sooner has J J Japan recovered from that, the Olympics get canceled. I mean, it's not just... Okay. Cool. Okay. <laughs> 
Well, uh, was it, did I forget anything in between? Anyway, so, so, so here's the alternative way you could tell the story. And I want you to tell me how, why my version is wrong. And, and the alternative way is to say, isn't it remarkable that in this entire period, Japan has at the peak had an unemployment rate of 5%. It had, and uh, now it's back to whatever, two or 3% or whatever it is, so they, compared to other countries. And you know, there's a, there's a whole long tale to that story, why that is and how that reduces efficiencies and so forth and so, but, but still, right? So there's a social uh, stability, societal cohesion, um, the, the, yes, the responses, the responses to these crises were incredibly slow, but they're, but they're also deliberate. And slow does not mean zero, right? They're very deliberate. And so you could actually tell the story of, isn't it remarkable that at the end of all of this, uh, kind of this, this series of events, there is still uh, the third largest economy with some characteristics and features that would make a lot of other countries in the world envious. Yes, and, and just for those of you who haven't read it, uh, Ulrika, of course, is, is making the case, the argument that she makes in her book as a way of subtly shoot bringing, as always, it's always, we were talking, it's always about her. It's never about me. Um, no, it's, it's, it's a very important argument. And I think you're on to something in a larger context about capitalism, right? And the, I mean, that's ultimately what we're talking about is a model of capitalism and an embrace of change. And let's be very clear, I'm certainly by no fan, no means a fan of Anglo-American capitalism and the way that it's, it's you know, it's, it's, it, it, it's pell-mell pursuit of financialization and, and the loss you know, the, of, of the skill set, et cetera. And so I am well aware, and again, I'm not making a judgment about the correctness of the Japanese position, but I guess the, the simple answer, and you and I have discussed this before, is that for all the change that's occurring, the Japanese change is occurring too slowly to keep pace. I think with the, with the world that's changing around it. And that's, there's no, you know, you, statistically you're quite right that you look at the low employment rate. I think you dig a little deeper into the, to the, to the, um, the statistics and you see the types of jobs that are being created, the way that, that it's being, um, you know, that, that, that the economy is not evolving in ways that would perhaps best prepare it for the, 20, the challenges of digitalization. And again, I know, and you, you know, I'm a huge fan of your book, and I, I, I've tried to wrestle with who is right and who is wrong. And um, I think, you know, both of our views can coexist. And the argument becomes essentially that Japan has a tough challenge ahead of it to make the transition. Uh, it's doing it in ways that are perfectly consistent with Japanese values, um, as you say, slowly, carefully. But I just think that the rest of the world is changing too quickly for Japan as a country to maintain its status and place in the world. And it could do that with some important shifts and changes, but I don't think it is for a bunch of different reasons. I think, you know, one of the key issues though, is as you, as, as um, you know, it, it was Taro Kono who, when I interviewed him, and Taro's an old friend, and uh, he was just a, a, an LDP backbencher in those days and, and a real bomb thrower, but he comes off you know, anybody that's, that's looking at his career now, I think if you read what he says in the book, he's an unbelievably thoughtful guy. I mean, he always was. And he, his ability to um, understand both his country and the particulars, the, some of the absurdities of it as well, and the particulars of his party. You know, one of the things that keeps coming out, you know, I talked to him and others, and Shinjiro Koizumi was someone who I interviewed many times for the book. I happened, I'd known him before he became a politician. So, and I, of course, intruded upon that relationship to, to borrow. And, and, and again, Shinjiro comes off as a very, very thoughtful guy. I mean, he's really sharp. Um, and, you know, both of them essentially argue that the LDP has to reinvent himself. And both of them were very concerned that, their, that the parties turned in the wilderness in 2009 to 2012 would not be long enough for it to learn the real lessons of how it had to adapt to the future and I think, you know, quite frankly, the exhaustion and fatigue that we're seeing in, in Tokyo today is a, is a function of, of that. You know, the, the, the LDP resorted to its old habits and, uh, and that's where it is today. And that, that, that's, that spells trouble for the country and that really worries me. But one of the things that Tara said, I thought was, was you know, our resilience, our, uh, you know, the, the, the whole cultural comportment question, our ability to struggle, to, to not 
precisely to not uh, rise up in the populism or the anger in the aftermath of, of you know, a decade of stagnation, et cetera. And then, again, a bunch of explanations for that. But our resilience is, it was, quote, an absolute break on change. And I think he's right, that everything in the country militates precisely against that kind of enough is enough, we've got to do something to, to change our future. And so, you know, the, precisely the strengths that you identify, um, to say nothing of the fact that at a time of shrinking population, you can have zero pop, uh, economic growth and still maintain, have your GDP grow, right? It's just a, a, a cute statistical trick. That in that universe, in that world, what you end up with is, is a country that, that is uh, um, rolling along and everything says, take what you've got, be happy with it. And you know, at the end of the day, as somebody who, despite having wrote this book, moved back to Tokyo in 2017, you know, uh, frankly, I'm prepared to put all those Michelin stars uh, up against a, a lot of, of, of demographic crisis, potential demographic crisis in the future. I mean, it's, it's, this is a wonderful city to live in, COVID notwithstanding. So um, what would you have to see to think that you were wrong? I mean, what, what would be the... <laughs> be better than that. That doesn't happen. So, so there's no way Japan can get out of this dilemma? Is it no, just, that's not, not, not. No, no, no. I, I mean, that's, that's a really good question. I suppose, you know, and the problem is, is that I don't like the solutions that, you know, again, a neoliberal economic answer is not the way to go. And you see, again, the seeds, I think, of some alternative thinking. And I think that, you know, what, what has to happen is, quite frankly, you, Japan would probably have to shed it, its great power ambitions among its leadership. And it would have to, to, to put serious um, meat on the bones of an idea of an alternative kind of model for international behavior and international governments, uh, in the sense that, you know, Japan just really, for all the talk, uh, remains wedded to, I think, 20th century notions and, 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 and uh, uh, industrial society notions of, of great powerness. Um, and uh, whether, you know, I have to think more, you know, there, there are ways that you can take a shrinking economy, a, a reduced footprint, uh, sociological or, or political economic footprint, and turn that into a, a you know a real source of international strength in the world, but I it, um, a lot of it I think has to do with frankly some fundamental reassertions. I think there needs to be well I think I, I say this in the book. One of the first things you have to do is go back to Datsua and you have to recast the relationship with Asia in ways that put Japan less in the West and more in Asia, and that's. You know, the, the particular contours of that are, is difficult um, as an intellectual exercise because and that speaks to so much. I mean, it has to do with the relationship with South Korea. It has to do with the relationship with China, the relationship with the United States. And I'm not suggesting an end of the alliance. I'm not suggesting greater. I, I mean, I'm saying I want greater closeness, greater integration with Asia without necessarily giving up the distance from the United or creating distance with Washington. And that's that's a very, very calibrated, very, very difficult exercise. And, and Japan seems far too wedded to its existing status in the world. And I'm afraid that at some point it probably has to give that up with the name, with, in the name of recasting that. And as I hear myself saying, speaking of saying all this, it sounds like pablum and nonsense. And so if anyone's listening and you want to pick me apart on that, don't even bother. I'm, uh, it's too early in the morning for me to put up with that. So, so, but, but you know, so I, I think that this is actually one of these things, right? So there's a term for this in psychology, which is the self-reference criteria, where you measure yourself against some sort of benchmark and how you set that benchmark then determines whether you're a happy or an unhappy person, right? Uh, because if, if, if Japan wants to be like the United States, that's not going to happen, nor is this something that Japan now wants. Right. It, it, I don't know when this was, Brad, I don't remember. Was it 20 years ago or so that you started talking about the Switzerland model for for Japan, yeah. what, what, what was it, the Switzerland of Asia? It, the Swiss option, it was actually it was a, it was a short piece that, yeah, I wrote back in, uh, gosh, I think like 2001 or 2002 was when it first took for and, and um, it was, uh, was a, the argument very simply was, was that the Japanese were, um, were, were, were 
in Asia, but not of Asia. And what they really wanted was essentially to be left alone, to be uh, geographically accepted, but by and large distance from the, the, the perturbations and all of the, 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 the complications of Japanese, uh, of regional politics. It was sort of, don't, don't, you know, give us your money, let us sell you your products, but essentially leave us out of your messes. It's, it's, it's just for us, it's, you know, and that kind of uchi muki perspective, I think, has, has only intensified in so many different ways. And that there is, I mean, it, it's in contrast in Osaka, but I think among the Japanese people, right, there is this belief that really we don't want to get entangled in all of this. Um, and there's a, uh, you know, and you see that just in the, the, the levels of international engagement, the English language skills, I and mean, we all know the statistics and we all know that, that you just see that the Japanese are very, very comfortable culturally, uh, economically, all being focused on themselves rather than the rest of the world. And, and that, I think, goes, speaks to, you know, one of the, an earlier question of yours, which is, it's difficult, it's going to be extremely hard for Japan to maintain its position, certainly in, in the economic world, when, I mean, fine, they, 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 they establish the niches and they seize the niches that you've identified in your book. But at the end of the day, when your domestic market is shrinking and you've got to rely on external events to create the dynamism and to create the growth in so many different ways, in so many, in, in, in many spheres of your economy, in your society, well, it's, it, you, you, it's, it's really hard when you don't speak the language and you really don't want to be bothered with the nasty, dirty, you know, little uh, local customs. And I see an expression of this, quite frankly, um, in, in some of the political developments. When you think about the structural shifts that the Japanese, you know, what is it required to do if Japan wants to become, to stay on the cutting edge and to modernize its economy? Well, you know, I look at the integrated resorts plan and I see that as the antithesis of that, right? Instead of structural changes, what you've had over the last couple of decades is the decision to put uh, national holidays on Mondays or Fridays, right? So to lengthen the amount of time off to, 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 to sharpen and to increase consumer spending. Instead of, of structural reform, what you want to do is you want to create these little casinos, you know, three of them, in various parts of the country that attract, you know, up in the north, you're going to take Russian money, and down in the south, you're going to take Chinese money, you know, in, in, in uh, further out, you're going to take Asian money. Um, and we're going to make it, of course, very difficult for Japanese to spend their money, and we're going to keep them on these little, you know, literally islands where we, we keep them in, in sort of gambling ghettos, and we'll take their money, and we'll clean out their walls, and then we'll send them back home, and they won't infect the rest of the economy. That strikes me as a kind of cute, but ultimately, um, you know, ineffectual method of uh, stimulating your economy to say nothing of the fact that Corona suggests that you, you, any, you know, if you, you're going to bet your future on tourism like that, you're probably on a pretty shaky platform. <laughs> so what is the reception of you in, 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 in Japan? So you just wrote, you just said you, you were, you made it, a, a positive effort to talk to Japanese. You wanted to hear the Japanese voice. There's a lot of self-deprecation in Japan. Of course, I mean, it's part of being polite. You know, oh, we Japanese, what about anyone? You know, we can't do this, we can't do that. We're not good at this, we're not good at that. But it's one thing if the Japanese say it. And it's another thing if a foreigner says it. Even yeah. if the foreigner has really talked to a lot of people in Japan. Right. And so, so what is the, what, what, what's the reception? I mean, are people saying, Ooh, you know, maybe we should rethink this or are they saying yeah, go yeah. away or? Two, two, um, two angles of attack on that. The first, I think the technical term for the reception of the book is crickets, um, meaning uh, <laughs> silence. Uh, I can hear the, I can hear the crickets in the evening, the cicadas as they, uh, as they come out. Um, Two, uh, let me offer you, you know, let me offer you my, my anecdotes uh, that, of course, tell you very little, but anecdotes are anecdotes. Uh, the first was a foreign ministry buddy of mine who says, thanks, we like, you know, I like your book, it's great, you know, and I asked him what the silence, he goes, well, you know, I agree with everything you said, and I think most of us do, but you don't have to rub our noses in it. Um, and I, 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 I would, if I, if I had, if I was more sensitive, I probably would have hurt my feelings. Um, but the, the fact is, you know, it was, it, it, I took that as something of a, a validation. Um, and I, I try to be sensitive. Uh, the second comment was from a, a, a policy person 
who basically said, well, if the Japanese don't say anything to you, it's because we, we pretty much agree with what you had to say. So I'm going to take both of those to the bank. Um, and if the Japanese don't care, I, I will tell your, the, the audience that I just, the book was just published in, in Korean. Um, and I was uh, uh, the, the head of the leading opposition party in uh, conservative opposition party, apparently read the book. This is a news story about this. Read it, said he liked it so much, he's giving copies of it to every member of his party in the National Assembly. So apart from planning for my retirement on this, I mean, I think, you know, anything that beats up on the Japanese is going to sell in Korea. Um, so, uh, but I mean, honestly, I think the, um, there is a little bit of that, but there's also a sense that this is a, a cautionary tale for the Koreans. I'd like it to be seen in those terms, that this is, that from somebody who believes really, really strongly in the U.S.-Japan relationship, who believes in the extraordinary potential of this country. And again, I come back here. I'm, this is beautiful, hot, sweltery Tokyo that I'm speaking to you from, not, not breezy Hawaii. Um, that this is a country of, uh, with, 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 I have great affection. And, you know, it's a country that my concern is the gap, again, between the expectations and the reality of Japan is such that in a crisis, things will get bad because the Japanese are not prepared to do what it is that I think a lot of people expect of them. And I wanted to, I wanted to dampen, I wanted to create a better understanding of where the country is. And so that the, the, that potential crisis would not take place. So we having uh, some questions coming in. Um, uh, uh, there are uh, two questions, Aram and, uh, and Felix want to know uh, about the young. So you mentioned the young earlier, that, they, that the, what, what the young people are thinking is actually quite different from maybe what some of the politicians are doing. Right. What's your sense of what, you know, we, we, in the U.S. we currently have the millennials, they want to do this, they want that, and the millennials are a big place, right, so there is a lot of variation in that. Is there something like the young Japanese that wants something, or are, is that also a very big place with a lot of variegated sort of needs and, and wants? You know, obviously, you know, there is... Um... Generalizations are true in general, and they're not true in particular. I mean, you know, we, we forget this is still a population of 127, six point something million. You know, I think it's the eighth largest country in the world in terms of population. I mean, it's, it's, it ain't tiny. Um, so, of course, there is. And there is the young Japanese. I mean, I, I quote um, what's his name, Furuishi's book, um, you know, The un Unhappy Youth in an Unhappy Country. And the, the, the view that I get is, is that this is a, 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 a country in which people are just not as entrepreneurial. They are not uh, young people. And we all know, for those of us that look at this, on a, I suppose, for those of you, because I wouldn't call myself a sociologist, those that kind of look at, the, you know, the, the, the education system, it's not, it hasn't, it hasn't encouraged creativity, innovation, the kind of free thinking you know, that, that frankly, again, you get at in your book when you talk about the ambidextrousness of Japanese businesses, right? Where you have to have the, 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 the process-oriented development married to radical innovation that allows them to identify these niches. And that's, that's hard. And, you know, I think that you find, you're probably more likely to find that in the engineering classes where you can do that kind of research and, and make those as opposed make that kind of those great leaps through a very rigorous process whereas it strikes me in the social sciences either you, you start with this kind of radical approach and get there you, you inculcate that at a young age or 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 you don't and so you know young japanese strike me or, and they're smart of course they're capable women are far more capable than men uh, i'm sorry to say uh, no i'm not sorry to say it's just a fact um They've had to, and of course, they're under-recognized and undervalued for that. Um, and, but there isn't the ambition, right? And I had a, a young Kyoto student, uh, a woman tell me, you know, she, she'd studied in London, I think, and she said she, was, she compared herself with her Chinese and her Korean friends who were just cramming their resumes with all of this, um, uh, uh, you know, work experience because they were facing such a competitive environment. Whereas in Japan, it was like, we don't have to bother with that. I, you know, I'm, I'm going to have a skill set that's going to be marketable. And I mean, if you think about it, and, and, and one of the 
at least one of the explanations that I've come up with, and I have absolutely no data to, to support this other than just um, drinking sessions, uh, is that in a society in which your population is shrinking, obviously there's just only a, a limited amount of people to fill the jobs. And, and this is a cult, and, and Japan is a company, a country that doesn't necessarily forgive failure. And so what that does is it encourages young people to just keep their heads down. Don't take risks. Don't do anything that's a potential black mark on your record. Don't innovate. Don't, don't step out of your lane. And in so doing, you ensure that you are, when the time comes, you'll find yourself in a place where you, you're able to get that job. And so it is, again, it reinforces the risk aversion and, and, and a, a just sticking with the system as it exists. And, and so, and you put that on top of all of the, um, just the education system that, that, that prizes, you know, the recitation, the rote memorization that does not encourage the individualism and the, the stepping out of law, you know, the, 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 the boxes that are, they're provided to. So all of that, again, reinforces this sense of, um, uh, uh, um, you know, of uh, 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 stasis. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. And, and, and I, as I listen to myself, I, I hear some of your harder edge students and perhaps faculty that, that, that are quants, et cetera, quants in making in, 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 in waiting, or perhaps that's, that's where they're cutting their teeth onto this, this day. You know, it's like, God, that's squishy. You know, it's just nonsensical, silly stuff. And that may be true, but at the same time, you know, the reaction of the Japanese I speak to, all of them kind of go, yeah, you know, that, that, that's kind of right. And, and there's no, it's, it's anecdotal, data, right? It's not, you're not able to provide the, the, the large, hard edge statistical support for the claims that I'm making, but everybody's, you know, everyone kind so of- we had, uh, we had Gany Sayama here two weeks ago, and he, he was talking about how things are actually changing because job mobility is up. And as job mobility increases, suddenly there's also the, so the whole social status about doing something that is not lockstep uh, has, is actually, uh, yeah, exactly. But so, so what, so you mentioned the word ambition and you, and you actually mentioned it 20 minutes ago where you said that Japan is too ambitious in terms that it wants to be the leader or something. Mm, you may reframe this question, oh, correct oh. me. But, but what should the, so, so who did you write this book for? I mean, so, so who should read this and say, ooh, I've got to change my ways, or, oh, yes, we're dead, or we're sunset, so I should, I should do, you know, so, so is, there, is there a takeaway from, from this for some particular people in, in Japan? Probably. Um, yeah, I hope so. L let me back up a little bit, you know, and it occurs to me like you, you, you your, your previous guest and, and, and your comment about, you know, of course, I think you can always find in a country of 127 million people, you're always going to be able to find people that counter examples that prove that there is change that, that, that the larger argument that I'm making is, is disproven in these particulars. And I don't doubt that for a heartbeat, but it strike. but I guess the larger point is, is that these little pieces of dynamic change are insufficient in a world that we live in, faced by all of this larger and, and a larger constellation of social forces that, you know, uh, reinforce many of the cultural traits and sociological traits that, frankly, dampen, encourage resilience and dampen change. And I mean, I think that, you know, that, that I'll get to your question about the audience, but, you know, that, that's another piece of this, that, that, that and, and that's the great challenge, for example, of, of reformers like Abe, who understand that really, if you want to goose the economy, in a lot of ways, what you have to do is unleash the power of women. And you really have got to, you know, give them the opportunities and you have to make the changes that afford women the choices that they wish to have. You know, the demographic crisis is very much a function of women saying, we don't like the futures you're giving us and we're opting out. And, but... The countervailing consideration for people like Abe, who and, and who believe in economic dynamism, is but we also have a, a particular type of preferred social order, and how we reconcile the changes that we wish to see, you know, the economic changes that we want, with the 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 damage that that has the potential to do to our idealized social order where women have a place. Um, that that tension is unresolved and tends to be resolved in the favor of the traditional. And, and, I, and by that, I just mean what we have because we are small C conservatives and we are very averse to change. And so, you know, and then, you know, you pile on top of that, the, the interest groups and all the other obstacles that you can always come up with. 
But, you know, I, I, like I said, you've got attitudinal issues, you've got cultural issues, you have demographic constraints, you have social mores, you have a philosophy, you know, you've got this notion of mujo and, and, and this wonderful sense of evanescence. And, and I mean, you, there's all of these things that constrain and, and, and limit the, um, the, I think, the, 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 the readiness of the society to change. And just, I'm sorry, I, I was reading a review of the book because that's how I spend my free time uh, a couple of weeks ago. And it was really, I, 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 some journal, I can't remember. And the, the reviewer was saying something about how, well, Glosserman only lists all these structural constraints. And I remember thinking, did you not read the last chapter? It is all about attitudes. I mean, give me a break. It's like, what do I have to do? And I've, I've, uh, I've managed to keep that inside until now. So I apologize to your, to your audience for venting. And speaking of, so audiences, um, I, I, I wrote this for my mother, meaning that I wanted this book to be something that, that as you put it, people could understand without having a, a strict background. And, but the form that it took uh, it speaks a lot to, the particular form that it took speaks a lot to um, uh, uh, the nature of the publishing industry these days. And, and by that, I mean that to answer the question of whether nine, or 2011 was gonna be a, a Meiji moment, I thought as you dug into it, really required a big answer, a, a, whole, of, a whole of society assessment. And so I went through the process I described and publishers were not interested in that. And I think, you know, as I, as I mentioned in the introduction of the book, a lot of that has to do with the fact that Japan is just not, doesn't have the sexiness, the, the, the interest that, that China does right now. And so everything Japan has seen, you know, the Jap U.S. relationship with Japan is a function of the U.S. relationship with China. And that's wrong, but that's the way it's, it tends to be looked at. And so I figured, all right, well, if the initial draft of the book didn't, um, wasn't so appealing. What a, clearly the problem is it's not long enough. So I doubled it in length to 170,000 words and lengthened every chapter and took everything. And weirdly enough, that didn't solve my problem either. So then I thought, um, and, and that it, what, what it really required was an academic focus. And you know, you know, and people that may be listening know that there's nothing that makes, makes my skin crawl more than this notion of academicism in, in, in work. I mean, I'm a very practical person. So I, I framed it through this methodology of crises. And I rewrote the whole thing to, as, as crisis and, you know, the, the, the literature review and all that stuff. And that didn't work. Uh, but a publisher said, we like your book. We want it to be general. I thought, okay, that's, I can do that. So then I went back to the original formulation, found this, this, this shock kind of framework that worked for me and updated it and, modern, and, and took it up to, gosh, like the summer of 2018, I think is when the, the, the final edits were made. And, uh, and, and so that was the book, but it was, it's clearly, I mean, I, I, what I want is the Japanese to understand, I think that the signals that they're sending, uh, but I mean, the primary audience obviously is non-Japanese audience, as I said, and it's about an attempt to, to understand what the reality of this country is and to reconcile better, to, to, to have a better understanding of where the limits are, what Japan is and can do. So the signals that are being sent, right? So that's super interesting. And we have all been in situations where this self-deprecation is sort of kind of backfires. Um, so academic, about me or about Japan? No, 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 Japan. So I go to an academic conference, a Japanese colleague stands up and he starts his presentation or her, actually his mostly, as you just said, his presentation about some, it's a very good paper and it's a very nicely done research. And yet the presenter starts with saying, well, I don't really know much about this topic and I haven't really, we've all been to conferences where this happened, but, and, um, and that was okay, I think, as, until, um, until globalization happened. And just like the Japanese newspapers only writing bad things about Japan, it's okay un, un, until the day where all of this gets translated into English. And as we keep reading, Japanese are saying themselves that their country is, you know, that they're a sunset place and also many problems. And so, so I'm wondering, I'm, I'm hoping that some of the people who read your book in Japan will say, well, maybe we should talk a little bit differently about who we are and what we want and think a little bit differently about who we are and what we want. Um, I mean, I, I'd like to think I'm sympathetic to that. I mean, and, and I think, again, what the... Um, who they are and what they want is the country they have. I mean, in the sense that it's, it is, uh, you know, there's a, uh, let's see if I can find the line. There's a beautiful line, uh, a woman named Lily Mura, who talks about, you know, she, all she, I think the quote is, the comment is, all I've known is lost decades, but my country is rich, beautiful, and comfortable. 
And I mean, kind of hard to argue with that, right? It, it, it's, it works in so many ways. There isn't, there isn't unrest. There isn't great dissatisfaction, at least to where the Japanese are prepared in some, in surveys to say they feel as though they're, you know, I think a few years ago, even before I think the, the, the bloom was off the, the rose as far as Abe was concerned, the Japanese were among the most pessimistic in the world in terms of what the future generations, what, how they would, their, the outlook for, for young people was. Um, you had uh, uh, just a, a profound sense that, that they were distrustful of authority, uh, of, that they didn't, you know, you, you look at the, the um, gosh, what, I'm, I'm sorry, the Edelman barometers, right? And the Japanese were always kind of on low and had, had particularly low marks on, on, on some institutions. Um, and yet, and you had the periodic protest votes, but you never quite had the mechanism for reform. You never, you never, you never took that to the point where the public was prepared to make the changes. Politically, they tried it in 2009 and they got so badly damaged by that that they are, they're completely skittish about anything that might undermine, you know, there's no faith in the, in, in the opposition anymore, um, such as it is. Uh, and, and you just have this readiness to kind of take as given the world around you. Uh, and, and of course, it, it's reinforced, as I said, by both philosophy, by culture, by, by uh, education, et cetera. Everything encourages a quietism and acceptance uh, uh, um, and then it's leavened with this sense that, man, you know, in lockdown, I've got more delivery options or, or, or takeout options than I own any city in the world. And I mean, that may sound trivial, but it's, it is the way in which most people, I think, experience their lives and their cultures and decide, is this good enough for me or not? So uh, as a German historian once pointed out to me, uh, the leading industrial industrialized nations in the world, Germany and Japan are the only two that have not had a revolution. Which is interesting because you started out with the Meiji moment, but the Meiji moment was actually not a revolution. It was not like it was it was a big change. It was a sort of a big sort of demarcation point in Japanese history. But it but it wasn't really something that the people did, right? It was something that uh yeah, I mean, you know, you can make the argument, of course, you look at the, the biggest shift, the only, when the Japanese, the only other time in, the, in, in modern history when the Japanese changed their political direction was essentially a revolt by the leaders, right? When, when Ozawa decides in 92 and 93 that it's time to, to change things. But, and to your comment about revolution, I mean, you don't need a revolution when you have occupation in 1945, right? <laughs> yeah, well, Ed, that's a very good point. But but let's let's look a little bit. So Edward has a really good question, which I like. And uh, you know, you talk in your book. That about the Edward Dong program. is that for, is that the Edward Dong? I guess so. Okay. He asks. Uh, you have a you have a thing on your a chapter on your book on Abe to the rescue, and he comes in and he has this whole program. We had uh, Barbara Holt who's on our show a few weeks ago, where she talks about the Olympics were having been set up as this like big thing where Abe could finalize his vision for the Utsukushi Kuni, the the beautiful country. What Edward wants to know is Utsukushi Kuni Dokoe, where is this beautiful, wonderful country that Abe has envisioned, promised, I don't know, made made the goal point? Uh, where, where is it? Where is it headed? And, and by the way, apropos uh, talking about this topic, I just read in the news, was it today or yesterday, that there's some rumor in Tokyo that Abe might be having, you know, kind of heading somewhere else, going, bowing out, bowing out, kind of design, resigning, well, whatever, no longer wanting to play. Well, there, okay, let, let's, let's, let's put Abe's contemporary, well, what's going on in Tokyo right now, let's put that aside for a second, although it's lots of fun. Um, first, I would urge your reader, your, everybody here, uh, Tobias Harris, his, you got his new book on the Iconoclast, is the, it will be out in a few weeks, I believe. And I've got a copy of it, and it's wonderful. Tobias is a great writer. It's, it's a wonderful read, really just well-written book, and deep in background. And, it, and, and I'm about, I don't know, 75 pages into it. And um, it, it's interesting, you know, it talks about the degree to, the, the profound impact that the 64 Olympics had on him. 
yeah. and that it really shaped his thinking about his country. And, you know, he's clearly trying to recreate that. And so uh, the, the degree to which the, the Olympics were supposed to be this, this, this valedictory moment, this extraordinary celebratory moment, uh, is, is um, you know, is, is deeply, deeply embedded. There's some ironies to that. I mean, first of all, of course, that the original bid for the Olympics was a, a DPJ bid, and it was kind of uh, taken over by the LDP and shifted and changed. And the original bid would was, was an attempt to break with this tradition of multi, multi-billion dollar renovation and, you know, like Sochi and like Beijing in 2008, um, you know, where it's this huge financial suck. And the original one was like, let's recycle all the old facilities and we're going to make this really green and we're, we're going to do all the stuff that in retrospect had the Japanese done it it would have spoken to a different kind of mentality and thinking about this and instead what you end up with is no it's going to be this wonderful huge parade of modern Japan etc cetera, etc cetera. and that speaks I think to the kind of the, the attitudinal adjustment to, for which I am uh, I, I, I speak about in terms of framing ambitions differently uh, the book begins, or the book ends, Peak Japan ends with a discussion of the Olympics, where uh, it's precisely, and I argue that it is, in fact, was more likely to be a bookend. 64 and, and, and 2020 were going to be bookends on a modern era, and it was all, you know, part of the peak, going to be sliding down from there. And we would look at this as this, this, um, that th this was this chapter in modern Japanese history. Um, as for where that vision goes, I, yeah. You know, the, Abe's vision is of a country that is responsible. I, I mean, I, I, I've come around very much on the prime minister, and it speaks a lot to his intelligence in the sense that if you, no one, I think, who saw his performance when his first term in the Conte would ever have predicted his second one. And it, 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 it speaks to his intelligence, right, in the sense that his ability to learn the lessons of that failure and, and to, for someone who is deeply conservative, and I think on a certain level, ideological, not bad. I don't believe he's pathological like some people. But I do think he has a deeply, profoundly conservative vision and nationalist vision for the country. And it is not, however, shared, I think, by the most of the Japanese because they don't really want the engagement. They don't want the responsibilities. But nevertheless, what Abe demonstrated was a capacity to moderate that idealism in the name of, very, of great pragmatism. And to, when he was challenged to step back and to you know, moderate bet between tacking between the economic pragmatism and then the, this, the national security and, and the nationalist idealist agenda. And that was, I think, a, a, it demonstrates a, a real gift, both to understand that that's necessary, which I don't think he recognized in his first term, and the ability to pull it off. And one of the problems is, is that I don't see anyone else really in the party at this point who is in a position to do that, who, can ma who, who has both the vision capacity to wrestle the LDP factions into place, control the bureaucracy, the institutions, and at the same time then have that capacity to, to tack, that pragmatic appeal. None of that exists, and that's why I'm very worried that if we look at, you know, one of the great things that Abe has brought is eight years of stability and one person in the Conte. And that cannot, you, it is almost impossible to underestimate, or I'm sorry, to overestimate how important that is. And once he's gone, I'm afraid we revert to the revolving door. And once again, you will see, particularly in a world in which power is in theoretically centralized, sorry, I'm, I'm going on, in that universe, then... then um, no, but this revolving door is, I mean, the prime minister, you actually have a list in your book of, of, of this time when we had one a year. And uh, that must have required some research because I think that even people in Tokyo don't remember who all of these prime ministers were, and in what order. So, so that is not a not a happy outlook. Um, last question, Brad. Before we let you go, you wrote a book about South Korea and Japan. Uh, can you can you give us a sort of a one minute, two minute? Uh, what's the vision there? Sure. Very simple. Sure. And and. You know, a lot of, I, I urge, it's, it, you know, South Korea, Japan relations are the gift that keeps on giving. They're always there. Um, the, um, the, the argument is very simple, that the conceptions of national identity in Japan and South Korea are inherently contradictory. And crudely, quickly, in South Korea, the occupation and the response to the Japanese experience in South Korea is the formative 
is the cornerstone of national identity. And thus, the Japanese are always available for Koreans to, um, I'm having, I'm ha this is my BBC moment. Uh, hello. hello <laughs> this, is what happens when you, this is what happens when you Zoom at home. Um, <laughs> and so, um, yeah, uh, Robert Kelly has nothing on me. Uh, <laughs> So the, the, the response to Japan becomes the cornerstone of modern identity, and it's always available to be pulled out in a moment of domestic weakness by a South Korean politician to say, to point to the Japanese and say, this is who we always need to keep in mind as the enemy. However, for the Japanese, national identity is premised on a, um, is, is premised on this notion that there's a radical break in 1945, and this is a, an incredibly peaceful country and that they are a different country than they were in the Imperial Japanese. And, and that therefore, when the South Koreans say, no, 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 we always must be alert and, uh, to who Japan is and its potential to revert to that, what you are essentially doing is denying, you know, this modern Japanese identity as well. So this clash between the two is based essentially, you know, the, the Japanese are trying to look forward, the South Koreans are trying to look back. And as long as those become the ways in which each considers itself in the, the definition of nationalism the, or, 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 or the, the formative component of it, that you're going to have the two countries at odds. Wow, that was outstanding. Thank yeah, you very much. Unfortunately, oh, we had an hour and a half. I would have had shorter answers. I'm sorry. I could, I could, uh, I could keep going for hours on end, but uh, I see our audience is going back to work or whatever they're doing. So, let me uh, thank you. Let, and and, and you want one let, more thing? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I just want to say thank you. Um, I urge all of your readers to buy my book so that my kid actually goes to college. Um, but equally importantly, I would suggest that you read yours as well. I really enjoyed your, your the business reinvention. I think it's a, a wonderful and important study. One, and frankly, the two books I think go together quite well. Um, and I want to thank you for giving me the chance to, to talk to, your, to, to you, to see you and to talk to your friends. Well, thank you very much. So uh, everybody, thank you for listening in. I'm sorry we couldn't pick up on more of the uh, very good questions, but there's always another chance. Uh, and indeed, next week, uh, we will be here, same place, uh, same time. And we'll talk about the vision of Japan's energy mix. We had energy a few weeks ago, and there was a, uh, it was a heated debate about whether or not Japan has a plan. And uh, we'll talk to uh, some of the people who will make this plan and, uh, and listen to what Japan is having uh, in mind in terms of environment, climate, and energy policies. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Brett. It was uh, fantastic, as always. Right. And everybody take good care and stay safe. Goodbye.